Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jonathan Fritz. I'm the Chief Innovation Officer for Chime. I'd like to welcome you to our Innovation Beyond the Edge series. Um, our host today will be muting you, um, and we ask that everyone that's on this call um, maintain uh, their Zoom link and, and maintain their connection on, on mute. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome everyone to today's uh, Innovation Beyond the Edge. This 12-part uh, series is designed to share creative problem solving in response to COVID-19 and highlight innovations implemented by your peers. Today's session is COVID-19 from the front lines of New York City. We know you're incredibly busy at this time and we appreciate you joining us today. Wanted to take a couple of uh, minutes just to talk briefly about why Chime is pre presenting this series. We believe that change presents challenges and problems, but also opportunity. Opportunity for creative problem solving. Chime members have faced many challenges, going from sudden remote workforce, spinning up and training clinicians on telehealth, infrastructure, resource constraints, and many others. From what I've personally seen, our members are some of the most creative problem solvers. They're really leading innovators. Innovation isn't all about bright, shiny objects. And during times like this, positively impacting and saving lives are the most impactful and valuable innovations, period. Before we get started with the presentation, I would like to cover a few details. Our session will have two main parts. One, presentations from our speakers, and two, virtual breakout sessions of four to five people so everyone can have a candid discussion on the topic presented. First, we're going to hear a brief presentation by Russ Branzell, the Chime CEO, followed by our main speaker, Daniel Barchi, CIO at New York Presbyterian Hospital. At the end of this time, we'll bring everyone back together to wrap up and review any outstanding questions and follow-ups. If you're unfamiliar with breakout rooms, that's okay. I'll give you brief instructions prior to splitting participants into the breakout rooms. We'll have everyone muted during the session. If you'd like to ask a question, please use the chat function to alert the team. The chat window will appear on your right side panel. To ask a question, type your message inside of the panel and press the send key. Speakers will try to answer as many questions as possible at the end of the presentation. However, there's a chance we won't get to everyone. If that happens, we'll collect all unanswered questions and respond and send responses via email to the attendee list. Also, we are recording this presentation. This will be saved and stored on the Chime site so you can go back and review any details once we finish. Discussions within the breakout rooms will not be recorded. If you have difficulty listening to the live audio stream through computer speakers, Keep in mind that you can connect to audio via phone. If you need help with that or any other technical detail, please use the chat window to send us your questions. For those connecting via phone and your computer, please message the host with your name and phone number. Our host will then merge your phone and computer connections. This will ensure that uh, you get into a uh, breakout room um, effectively. Lastly, by attending today's session, you will earn one continuing education unit for CHCIO, CFCHE, and CHISL certifications. We will review the attendee list following this session and distribute CEUs accordingly. With that said, I'm going to hand it over to Kali Durgampudi, the Chief Technology Officer of Greenway Health. Kali has been a tremendous supporter of CHIME over the years, and Greenway Health is a North American innovation partner that we greatly appreciate uh, their partnership. Kali? Thank you, Jonathan. And uh, thank you, Chime, for the opportunity. First, uh, we at Greenway Health are proud to play a small part in our healthcare ecosystem, and especially for our ambulatory customers in delivering the care. We're also proud to be part of this series and want to send our heartful and sincere thank you to everybody in the healthcare family and community at this time. Now it is my distinct honor and pleasure to introduce our two esteemed speakers today. Daniel Barchi, SVP and CIO of New York Presbyterian Hospital, and my dear friend and mentor, Russ Branzell, President and CEO of Chime. Russ, take it away. 
Thank you very much, Kali. Uh, it is an honor to be here and uh, in every way a person who uh, I consider one of the best CIOs in the country will be presenting in just a moment, Dan Barchi. He's definitely way outdressed the rest of us on the call today, but that's that's normal for him. Uh, I've actually got to spend quite a bit of time with a lot of our Chime, Chime Foundation, and just healthcare leaders around the globe on the telephone and on video chats and everything else over the last couple of weeks. And it is truly a time of great challenge, but but great, great opportunity and actually great achievement is what we're seeing happen across the world. Uh, obviously, different people are at different timelines of this battle, and I'm going to intentionally use the term battle as we go here. Uh, Dan and I are both veterans of the military, and those terms seem to, to easily flow off our lips here as you think through this. We've been fighting this battle, this one in particular, for just a few weeks, in some cases a few months, but the reality is our leaders, and we're hearing this strongly from all of them, no matter where they are, or where they are in the process, have really been preparing for this for years. We traditionally called that Chime 2.0, kind of the digital leader moving up to a different place where they were actually having to drive and actually create the change. Now, how did we see that? We saw that project after project after project. And people talked about that, how they, how they saw every single little thing as just a project that needed to get accomplished. But what we are seeing now is this concept of 3.0 change occurring. We're seeing some leaders really show off those skill sets in ways that they've never had to before. And that is creating this revolutionary and dramatic change in organizations. Now, admittedly, we've been saying for years, we needed some inflection point, some cause to have this change just rapidly adopt. Why has telemedicine been slow to adopt? Why is care outside the traditional walls of the hospital slow to adopt? There really wasn't a catalyst for change. The finance system wasn't changing. The payment system wasn't changing. There was nothing really occurring at that level. And if you just think about what we've done in the last few years with the electronic health record adoption, digital care being adopted, whether that's digital cardiology or radiology, you can just go through all the ologies that are there, but now starting the emergence of remote care and home care and meeting people where they are. But all of a sudden now we're created with this battle. This battle is right in front of us like we've never had before, where it's tested and stress tested every single thing we've ever done in healthcare and healthcare IT in particular. Now all of a sudden all those little projects, which didn't seem so little at the time, absolutely are coming together. And we're hearing this again across the entire planet. For the first time ever, there has been the inflection point to bring all those solutions together in ways we've never had. And in many cases, innovative new ways of applying them that we couldn't even have dreamed of. Turning coliseums into hospitals, turning hotels into hospitals, turning people's homes, admittedly, into clinics. And I will tell you, after spending weeks listening to people Weeks have become, our years have become weeks, weeks have become hours, and hours seem to have become minutes like we've never seen before. I will tell you there's no better 3.0 leader that I would follow any given day in any given way, and that is Daniel Barchi, one of our dear friends to Chime, one of my dear friends and mentors. Daniel, I'll turn the rest of the time over to you. Thank you, Russ. Thank you for that kind introduction, and thank you, Kali, for making this all happen. I appreciate uh, Chime and the way Chime is connecting us all and sharing information about what's happening. Um, Russ and I spoke before, and I appreciate Jonathan making this happen. And we thought that I would share some of the experiences that New York Presbyterian and my colleagues at other New York City hospitals have had as a way to give insight about ways that CIOs at other health systems, both across the United States and globally, if the pandemic has not hit locally, might prepare. We were talking earlier about the ways that we work on projects for months, sometimes years, and then something like this, like Russ described, an inflection point causes you to accelerate everything. So things that we were literally working on for months, we compacted into days. New initiatives that might take us weeks or months to get off the ground, we made happen in hours. And what we're finding is we need to be nimble, we need to be responsive, and quite frankly, we need to do whatever we can to meet the needs of our clinicians so that they're as prepared as they can be to take care of our patients. So I'll give you a broad situation report about where we are. Um, the numbers really don't matter by themselves because what really matters is when this is going to crest for everyone's own hometown or city. Uh, our numbers here in New York are large with thousands and thousands of infected patients. 
We've had many thousands of patients who've been admitted and discharged from our hospital. We have several thousand patients who are inpatient COVID positive right now. Many, many hundreds of patients who are in ICUs and on ventilators. And you've heard ventilators is the major topic that's come up nationally. It's interesting how the um, different challenges have presented themselves and then we've been able to work through them. Everyone's experience will be different, but for the first couple of days of this crisis, PPE was the hot topic, and we were focused on getting the right protective equipment for our staff, making sure that they were safe. And then it got to be ventilators, and ventilators were the big topic and making sure that we surged and prepared. And it was ICU beds and everything we needed to do to build out capacity. And now, quite frankly, it's staffing. We've done everything we needed to do to get as large as quickly as we could. And quite frankly, it's clinical staffing that is the challenge for us, having the right intensivists, the right nurses, We've had great, great cooperation from healthcare leaders from across the country who've sent members of their own teams, their own health systems to join us. And we've been very gladdened by that kind of help. We've also had people step up into roles that they've never served in before. So we have dermatologists and neurologists who are practicing in our emergency departments. We have pediatricians and orthopedic surgeons who are taking calls on our virtual care line in our emergency department. We have IT people who are running PPE and other logistics work around the hospital. Our IT team has volunteered and served in clinical and non-clinical support roles. We have vice presidents who are manning our 24 by seven virtual command center line who are not vice presidents from clinical or operational areas, but from finance and HR and IT. So I'd say every member of our team, and I think this is true, not just for New York Presbyterian, but every hospital in the New York Metro region, and quite frankly, it's coming nationally, is stepping up into roles that we've never done before. Let me give you an example of one of those programs that we said came together in a matter of hours. Now, this is a respiratory disease first and foremost, although I'd like to come back to that and talk about why it's always not just respiratory. But the big challenge is, can patients oxygenate their blood? So when somebody's showing up in the emergency department, it's an easy thing to throw a pulse ox monitor on them and say they're at a saturation level of 94 or even worse, a 92 or 89, we might need to admit them. So what does an ED physician do when she or he recognizes that the ICUs are full, our hospitals are full, and we'd really rather have a patient go home? So preferably, you know, in the past, we would have kept the patient in the ED for many hours or maybe admitted them in a watch status, but we really don't want to do that anymore. And so early on, our physicians were adopting different strategies, such as having patients stand up, walk around for a set amount of time, then, imagine, uh, then measure their oxygen saturation using the pulse ox monitor, and then make a decision about whether that patient was ready to go home or not. Um, it's kind of a catch-can catch way of doing it, and certainly physicians weren't comfortable sending patients home in that setting. So we developed a telemedicine capability, and we were already at the point where we were doing remote patient monitoring we accelerated that literally in a matter of hours. We'd ordered thousands of pulse ox monitors and started handing them out in our emergency department to the clinicians so that instead of sending somebody home and guessing about whether their pulse ox was an acceptable amount or not, now the patients are going home with pulse ox monitors. They're managing themselves. And we're following up the next day with uh, virtual care visits either via telemedicine or telephone calls from our emergency departments. We're checking up on those patients who we've sent home. And here's something that we'd never done before. We were wary of sending somebody home and hoping that oxygen caught up to them later from a DME supplier. So we went out and purchased several hundred oxygen saturation concentrators and even O2 bottles and created a program just in a matter of hours to send patients home with oxygen. So that's the kind of thing that our IT and innovation team put together worked with our clinicians, codified, and then sent people home quickly as a way to get them safer in a safe environment in their own home, but made sure we were able to manage, uh, manage patients in a remote way, but very, very quickly. Russ, I can keep going, but uh, let me stop right there and see if you have any comments or questions. Well, Dan, I guess one of the challenges was how quickly did this really come upon you? I mean, how, and what did you have to do to react to such a change? I mean, you're, you're putting, ICUs and sports stadiums at this point. How did, what innovation did you have to put in place? Sure, you had an EMR in, but how do you do such things in an innovation world? 
I'll do two things. One, I'll call out analytics, and I'm really proud of the analytics team that we have as part of New York Presbyterian, Weill, Cornell, and Columbia. Um, together, we tried to make a good early forecast of what we expected to see based on the Italian models and the Wuhan models. I just looked back on the data. Our first patient who was COVID positive was in New York in on March 1st of this year, so just about six weeks ago. And now we have many, many thousands um, of co positive patients. We have many patients who've expired from this disease. And like I mentioned, we've had more than 5,000 patients who've been admitted and discharged from our own organization. So it has ramped up very, very quickly. I think the lesson learned is there's no time better than now to prepare for what's coming. You can't really prepare in real time. And I think what we're seeing nationally, a lot of us are doing preparation and there's a risk, if you can call it that, of over-preparing and then having the numbers fall short of what the models might predict. I think that's a great thing. There's, um, there's no amount of over-preparation that anybody would argue put any patient at risk. We certainly want to prepare in every way that we can and be prepared so we're never at a point of making decisions about whether we deliver the right care or not. So in the first several days, we got a, a virtual command center team together we divided it up into clinical and non-clinical areas across all of our 11 hospitals. We put a senior leader in charge of all of our logistics and administrative and staffing and operated in a different way than we had before. We didn't just stay in our normal verticals. We operated as an integrated health system. We ramped up in every way that we could. We got all the resources we could. We got as many ventilators and other supplies as we could. We made sure that we had protocols for dealing with patients. We had protocols from everything about how to deal with the COVID area of the hospital and a non-COVID area of the hospital. We had body collection point work so that people expired during the care were taken care of appropriately and we were never overwhelmed in that area. We surged IT people to the front line. We had support teams. We stood up a uh, patient, um, sorry, an employee workforce health and safety line to deal with issues associated with staffing and questions from our own employees who were um, who were infected themselves, and in every way did everything that we could to prepare. And it was good because we feel like we might be at the top of the curve right now. But looking back just one week ago, we were in the thick, in the thick of it, and all the preparation we'd done in the weeks leading up to that put us in a good spot. Now, we might be at the peak for our ICUs, and we got to this point quickly, but their tail ramp is going to be a long, long tail for people to get, get, uh, to get better. What we find is the clinical condition of these people is bimodal. Either it's very short and intense or they're admitted and they're on a respirator for three or four days and then they get better and go or expire, or they're on a ventilator for many, many days, 10, 14 plus days with a very challenging outcome. So those patients that are on respiration for a long time are gonna need care both on a respirator and then thereafter, um, especially if they're trached or get other type of respiratory care. So one of the things that you and I've talked about, Russ, is that we've built some field hospitals in the cafeteria of several of our hospitals, including Queens and Brooklyn, in the uh, lobby of our hospital up at Columbia, another 50 uh, beds in a field hospital that allows us to deliver a high level of care. And then in conjunction with Columbia University, in their winter sports practice bubble on their soccer field, we've built a hospital out of nothing. So a lot of kudos to our facilities team, to our IT and biomeds team, or facility and logistics team to make a hospital with more than 200 bed capability that a week ago was at just a sports field underneath a bubble and will actually open tomorrow and be ready to care for patients. If you can think about taking an AstroTurf field under a bubble with nothing there, not even power, not even Wi-Fi, no oxygen, and providing all of that in a week, that's what we've done. So it's that kind of out of the box thinking that's allowed us to prepare and get as ready as we could. But it took a lot, of a lot of cooperation from a lot of leaders, a lot of clinicians, and a lot of support staff. Now, I'll just make one more comment, and you can react to that before we turn it back over to Jonathan here. And that is, I, I spent some time that, at lunch today, our lunch, their dinner, with a couple of our Italian comrades that uh, were right on the front line, Bergamo, Italy, which uh, was one of the first hospitals to take a patient. Uh, they took their first patient on a Saturday, and they were full by Tuesday. With, with none of this even known to be coming. And I asked him about innovation and technology and, and he corrected me in a really nice Italian way uh, in which he said, Russ, technology is important. 
the cool stuff we did with the technology was important. But the more important thing was innovation was leadership. It was the traditional relationship management that we've taken time and time to put together. Um, and it really came down to us doing the right things as leaders to build the environment that made us successful. And those that didn't have that were actually the cities they talked about in Italy that didn't do well during this crisis. So thoughts, because everything you described required extreme innovative leadership. It wasn't just that you did all the great technology as well. well thanks for raising that point, Russ. Uh, it took not only innovation, but a lot of flexibility too. You really have to think out of the box, to turn a cafeteria or a sports center into a hospital. You also have to be prepared to let go of the way that you've always done things. This was challenging, but we obviously canceled all of our regular cases. And then we had a number of ORs. So except for clearly trauma or life-threatening needs, we weren't doing surgery. So we have many, many hundreds of ORs across all of our hospitals. And we turned most of them into ICUs. So taking a normal OR and turning it into the three or four bedded ICU is a logistical and an IT and an operational challenge, but we did it. We're normally a 400 ICU bed health system. We ramped up to about 1,100 ICU beds. So that meant we made ICU beds out of ORs, out of PACUs, out of other recovery areas, out of med surge beds. And to the point you raised, Russ, we felt like by surging, we were able to handle this. Um, the number of patients we have in ICUs right now is many, many times more the 400 ICUs that we were with just uh, six weeks ago. The question is, after this is over, and certainly we want to prepare for a second wave if that's what presents itself, we need to get back to ORs and surgeries and caring for people who have conditions other than just COVID. So the question is, how do you ramp down in a thoughtful way, but not go back to the old way of doing it? You know, we don't want to go back to quote normal. How do we go back to a new optimized way of operating? And so in using the phrase that you started with, Russ, inflection points, we started thinking about how we might want to optimize. And this is where I think Jonathan and his team um, excel. What are the ways that we want to use this as an opportunity to question everything we did in the past? And instead of just taking those ORs and dismantling them so they're ORs again, what would we want to do with them in an optimal way? Or how would we want to leave some of our med surge beds so they can surge into ICUs? Or Perhaps we don't go back to five-day-a-week surgery, where it's seven-day-a-week surgery, or we never leave our virtual command center. We operate our health system with a vice president who's manning a virtual command center call 24-7. So we can always surge to meet staffing needs or logistics or equipment needs. All of these are opportunities that this crisis presented, and this is what we're focused on right now. And this is where I think this innovation series that Jonathan leads is helpful because it makes us think out of the box. Thank you very much, Daniel. Really appreciate your, your comments. Um, before we transition to, to breakout rooms, I just wanted to make one uh, comment. For those that have called in um, to this meeting, if you're also linked uh, through the computer, if you could uh, send our host uh, a message so that uh, she can connect you um, and merge uh, both your phone and computer. Um, Daniel, one other uh, question, hopefully that you can kind of comment a, a little bit about, um, you know, I know you and I have had conversations about innovation comes oftentimes from seeing friction points. Um, what, what friction was not present uh, given the circumstances that otherwise would have been that enabled you to actually get things done faster, quicker, perhaps even in you know, better fashion? It's a thoughtful point that you raised. Uh, you know, it's, it's easy as IT professionals to point to other areas of the health system and say that, you know, they're not helpful or they get in the way or an old trope about uh, finance not supporting with dollars or physicians not wanting to do something. Because it was a crisis, uh, to your point, Jonathan, all the friction melted away. So physicians said, what do you need me to do? Or how can we make this work? Our CFO was just outstanding. Uh, he was calling me and just letting me know, okay, we open POs, what do you need to do? We sent our entire remote, I'm sorry, our back office workforce, so roughly 4,000 IT and finance and HR and other support professionals. We sent them all home in a matter of days. That was a lot of iPads and uh, Chromebooks and other laptops that we purchased um, almost overnight. 
I couldn't point to any one area of uh, friction that melted away Jonathan because they all did. So everybody knew that there was a higher purpose. Now, there got to be a point about two weeks into this when we said, we think that we've made a lot of really good decisions. We don't want to overshoot what we're doing. We'd slow down and be thoughtful about it. And so not only did all the friction melt away, but when it came time to think, are we on the right trajectory? Can we slow down the expansion a little bit so we hit roughly the right point? All the teams work together well there as well. Excellent. Thank you, Daniel. Um, any closing comments that you'd like to make to your fellow CIOs that are calling in and listening, uh, given where uh, your system currently is, especially that they may be kind of um, behind the, or they may be on the front end leading to their peak, any preparation, any other recommendations that you might want to share with them? I'd say first and foremost, we all have really sharp data analytics professionals uh, as our colleagues in our health system. Use them. Don't count on the national or even your state or city models. Get your own team to model out what might happen and look forward. We found it very, very helpful and found that our team was within 5% most of the way in terms of what the ramp up would look like. And it allowed us to get very thoughtful about how knowing where to vector resources also, don't assume that it's going to hit every part of your town or city or state the same way. Uh, early on, Queens, New York, was a big challenge for us. And in the past week or two, that slowed down. Now, northern Manhattan and Westchester have blossomed as uh, parts of the, uh, the Tri-County, Tri-City area that have really gotten challenging. So it's almost on a zip code by zip code basis. And anybody who works in a health system with multiple locations shouldn't assume that it's all going to hit at the same time. So I focused on analytics, preparation, and thinking of it on a zip code by zip code level. Excellent. Thank you very much. We really appreciate it. I know you've been a long supporter of Chime and uh, really appreciate you uh, taking the time, given the circumstances that you and your organization are going through, um, to, to share with, uh, with Chime members today.